Um, you know, with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Professor William Maley. Uh, Professor Maley is Professor of Diplomacy at the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy here at the ANU. He's a barrister of the High Court of Australia, Vice President of the Refugee Council of Australia, a member of the Australian Committee of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, and in 2002 was appointed a member of the Order of Australia. William has been a vocal advocate for the rights of refugees for a number of years, and it's a great privilege to have him join us tonight. Please welcome Professor Maley. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, after Sophie's powerful and analytical contribution, I don't know that there's that much that I have constructively to add, uh, but I do have a number of thoughts that I'd like to share with you, uh, some of which may be a reflection of my own cynicism after uh, not nigh on 30 years observing refugee policy in Australia. Uh, but I do think uh, that they are pertinent to the question of whether Australia has anything to offer Europe at all, and I think uh, we uh, we could happily offer some politicians to Europe as long as we had a guarantee that they wouldn't be sent back. <laughs> what I'd like to do is divide my remarks into three broad categories. I want to say a little bit about the roots of the crisis and some of the structural features that have uh, contributed to where we find ourselves now. I want to say a little bit about principles for responding to uh, crises of the sort that we've witnessed. And then I want to say a few things about Australian policy uh, and, uh, and why anybody who looks at it carefully should be groping for a sick bag. Uh, well, I think what we're witnessing at the moment is the confluence in Europe of a number of different things. One is a set of uh, refugee producing situations, uh, each of which in relatively recent times has witnessed patterns of deterioration which not only drive people from the country which um, uh, is specifically in focus but also incline people who previously have fled that country to the view that there's no realistic prospect of safe repatriation in the foreseeable future and that the only realistic way to guarantee a meaningful life for themselves or their families is to move on to some kind of country which could qualify as a realistic venue for long-term asylum. And the cr three crises which have contributed in this way are Syria, Libya, but also Afghanistan. And it's easy to lose sight of the fact that in the recent flow into Europe, uh, roughly 13% of people arriving or over 60,000 individuals have actually been from Afghanistan. And there are particular patterns that work there that I'll discuss a little bit later in these remarks. But I won't go into those situations more in more detail because they've been uh, abundantly canvassed in uh, the media and uh, we know enough about the meltdown in Libya and the rise of ISIS in uh, Syria and Iraq to understand why people rationally would be keen to get as far away from those kinds of theatres as possible. Uh, another factor which I think is also coming into play in this situation is the impact of globalisation and the access that people who are fleeing persecution now have to visions of parts of the world which are stable and which offer them a kind of prospect for life that they may never have had any opportunity to enjoy in their country of nationality. And allied to this is something else which has not really been studied in detail but which I think is increasingly important. And that's the declining credibility of what one might call the birthright lottery model of one's place in the world. Uh, Professor Ayla Shaka wrote a very powerful book a couple of years ago uh, putting out the idea of the birthright lottery and raising the question why it is that we consider that some people who happen to be born in a country like Australia or the United Kingdom are entitled to all the fruits of uh, modernity whereas other people um, have a station in life in which they're expected to put up with murder and mayhem and uh, pillage and rapine and all those kinds of things. Uh, and I think it is becoming harder and harder to convince people that their natural status is one of being the persecuted. Uh, it's uh, in a globalised world where people can see that not everyone is in that situation, it's very easy for people to say, well, why should I have to put up with that? Uh, particularly if the only reason is to uh, keep happy the kind of people who listen, listen to shock jocks and, and think that Ray Hadley and Alan Jones are powerful intellects and things like that. Um, 
Another problem which has contributed to the current crisis has been the fragility of Greece as a frontline state. Uh, if one looks at the old uh, model for handling asylum which was developed some years ago in Europe, there was a notion that in the country in which people first arrived they would then be registered for asylum and, uh, and that country would have uh, initial responsibility. But the Greek crisis, which again has been very widely reported, um, highlights the extent to which we're actually talking about a near failed state there, which is hardly in a position to discharge some of the bureaucratic responsibilities that might other have otherwise have been dumped in its lap, and in addition has witnessed the rise of a fascist party, Golden Dawn, uh, which has been virulently hostile to uh, migrants and refugees, meaning that anyone who was rational would seek to get out of Greece as quickly as possible and head onwards in Europe. Allied to this is the fact that the Greek mechanism for determining refugee status is a one which is so ungenerous that uh, to call it a mechanism at all is probably a spurious use of the language. There's then the proximity of Europe to some of the theatres of operation that we're looking at at the moment. It's not that far from uh, some of the areas where refugees have congregated in the immediate aftermath of departure from, uh, uh, from some of the hot spots in the Middle East uh, to uh, countries in Europe as well. And uh, uh, proximity uh, simply means that people are more likely to go to a place that is in their neighbourhood as long as there is a prospect of securing refugee protection there. Now, Australia became a destination at the end of the 1990s and into the 21st century because for people coming out of places like Afghanistan or Iran to the east, Australia was actually the first country they would encounter, which was a party to the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees, the Menzies government having acceded to that convention in 1954. Uh, all the transit countries were ones in which even if people might be accommodated temporarily, there was no legal obligation under uh, a treaty to provide long-term protection and people who have just uh, come out of the frying pan don't want to stay in the fire for longer than absolutely necessary. The fundamental factor at play though I think in these movements is the radical disjuncture between the number of places for resettlement made available by developing countries and the need for resettlement. UNHCR has long argued that there are three durable solutions to refugee crises. Voluntary rep repatriation in circumstances of security, um, integration in the country of first asylum, or resettlement to a third country. Now there are plenty of people for whom the prospects of secure voluntary repatriation are negligible at the moment in the foreseeable future, and for whom countries of first asylum are not welcoming. One only needs to think of, of uh, Hazara Shia from Afghanistan in Pakistan witnessing bombs going off in Quetta in Pakistan directed against Shia targets in order to understand why that's the case. Uh, uh, so for a lot of people, real, realistically, the only uh, uh, durable solution is resettlement. In the last year for which we have total statistics, the year before last, uh, the UNHCR estimate was that a figure of 970,000 people were in need of urgent and immediate resettlement. And under 80,000 resettlement places were made available in total by countries that commit to manage resettlement programs. Uh, Australia commits to 6,000. Actually, the figure that gets quoted by ministers of 13,750 is itself misleading because um, the bulk of those positions are actually under the special humanitarian program for which you need a sponsor in Australia. And many refugees in the world with compelling claims will not have a sponsor and therefore won't be able to access those places. Um, now, when you have as huge a discrepancy as exists between the demand for resettlement and the supply of resettlement, there is nothing more predictable than that a black market will emerge. And uh, classical liberals would predict this. One, one would have thought that people in the Liberal Party who tend to venerate the market would also understand the way markets work in this kind of situation, that uh, it's utterly predictable. And uh, this is also one reason why the notion that our former Prime Minister uh, used to propagate that he had dealt with the problem of people smuggling is actually farcical, and I'll come back to that in, in just a moment. Now, if we're looking at principles for responding to the current crisis, I always think that um, Corporal Jones is a good starting point, don't panic. Uh, the, <laughs> the EU population at the moment, uh, EU 28, the current membership, is 506 million. 
So we're talking about about 500,000 people seeking to access Europe. This is a tiny fraction, tiny, tiny fraction of the European population. Uh, and whilst media reporting um, might suggest that the numbers that are seeking to uh, enter Europe are very large, and in absolute terms they certainly sound large compared to the tiny number of people who sought to access Australian protection over the last 15 or so years. Uh, as a proportion of the overall population of Europe, the problem is a minute one, which uh, Europe is more than capable of, of absorbing given the wealth of uh, Europe as uh, a, a, an economy and a major actor in, in the global economy as well. So uh, at one level, it's not a crisis at all, but of course, if something is seen to be a crisis, by key um, actors, it probably uh, has that character. And uh, one therefore needs uh, to take that into account when deciding how further to respond. Now, the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees is still the best basis for responding to challenges of this kind. Um, the, the 1951 convention was negotiated with substantial input from uh, Europeans in the aftermath of very large population displacement at the time of the Second World War. So there is no particular reason to think that the kind of numbers that wit we're witnessing at the moment are beyond the bounds of possibilities that loomed in the thinking of people who put the convention together in the first place. And it's actually quite difficult to meet the exacting criteria for being a refugee that are set out in the convention. One needs to have a well-founded fear of being persecuted for specific reasons. Uh, and that means that uh, uh, the, the responsibility uh, of, uh, that rests on people to satisfy um, governments that they deserve protection is actually a quite arduous one to discharge. Now, when you have very large numbers of people moving in a very short period of time, individualised assessment of claims becomes very difficult. And what often happens is that there is prima facie protection granted with the option of looking at a later stage at exactly what kinds of claims people might have. But it's important to recognise that under the Convention, it is not the act of a government assessing someone's claim that makes them a refugee. They become a refugee by satisfying the criteria that set that are set out in the 1951 Convention as a matter of international law. And therefore, it pays to treat people seeking asylum with respect because we know that historically very large numbers of people who've pursued risky routes in order to escape from persecution are likely to be found to be refugees. We know from Australia's own experience in the last 15 years that 80 to 90 per cent of people who've been assessed through this arduous process have been found to be refugees. Uh, and some of the people who've not been found to be refugees have been the victims of defective processes of assessment. So that probably needs to be factored into account as well. So governments don't make people refugees. People are refugees and governments may do a, a, a better or a worse job of coming to terms with that particular fact. The difficulty of burden sharing, of course, is that there are some countries in Europe at the moment that are holding out implicitly the threat of walking away from the European idea um, if they are asked to do their fair share of assisting people who are seeking asylum. And for those who remember events like the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968 or the earlier Soviet invasion of Hungary um, in 1956, which displaced hundreds of thousands of people into the Burgenland region of Austria. It's rather sad to see the right-wing governments in those countries taking positions towards uh, refugees which seem to be informed by no recollection whatsoever of the generosity that countries in the wider world showed to their own people uh, when Soviet forces came roaring in. Um, nonetheless, uh, at the moment, uh, and, and still substantially, the German government has, under the leadership of Angela Merkel, been prepared to take a strong stand. Uh, and, and ultimately, I think that the debates that are going on within European circles about how this issue that, uh, is to be handled will be sorted out. Uh, the danger, I think, is that uh, parties of the far right will seek to exploit what is not uh, a compelling issue at the moment in order to try to confect something that they can use to their own advantage. Now, we've seen that with Pauline Hanson in Australia. Um, 
I was in Vienna about a month ago at a period when Vienna was allegedly being besieged by more people from the Middle East since the time of the Turks. Uh, one would not have known it from walking around Vienna. There was absolutely nothing to uh, suggest that any unmanageable kinds of problems were coming up. What was clear, however, was that a very right-wing candidate for the position of mayor of Vienna was trying to stoke this issue up to his personal advantage. And that, I think, is one of the things that we certainly need to watch in this current situation. We also need to bear in mind that some of these um, movements are a product of defective decision-making by Western political leaderships in the past. So one of the interesting things about the, the uh, refugees from Afghanistan on the Hungarian-Serbian border in recent times, and a colleague and I uh, are writing about this, she's been doing interviews with some of the people in situ, is that a lot of those from Afghanistan came from the northern city of Kunduz, uh, which has been more recently in the news because the Taliban took it over two weeks ago uh, and mounted a reign of terror for about a week before they were driven out, uh, engaging in uh, murder and rape and all those sorts of things. And um, amongst the refugees who were on the, uh, the border between Serbia and Hungary were ethnic Tajiks from Kunduz who had got out because the situation had been deteriorating over time and like what are technically called anticipatory refugees, they recognised that the situation was, not, was going to get worse before it got better. Now one of the reasons Kunduz is in a mess, even though the Taliban some years ago threatened to turn it into the Kandahar of the north in Afghanistan, was the precipitate withdrawal of Western forces from Afghanistan, driven in turn by the domestic politics of a range of Western countries. And it's hardly surprising that with nothing having been done to address the issue of sanctuaries in Pakistan from which a force like the Taliban operate, they seized the moment to surge back once Western forces began to be minimally present in the north. Uh, and of course the civilian population finds itself caught up in the middle of this. And one of the alarming things about the refugee population in Europe at the moment from Afghanistan is that alongside people who've long experienced discrimination and persecution such as the Hazaras, one's now finding Tajiks from the north of Afghanistan and Pashtuns from eastern parts of the country where ISIS has materialised and is engaging in repressions of enormous brutality. Uh, and this um, uh, points to the potency of the push factors that remain. But it points to something about Australian policy as well, which I want to highlight, and I'll conclude with some comments about Australian policy. Australian policy is not one of solving refugee problems, it's one of displacing refugee problems. Yeah. The kind of people... <laughs> If there's a group of people at the moment who should be cracking out the champagne bottles in gratitude to people like Tony Abbott and Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton, it's actually the Russian mafia and European people smuggling networks because they have a new clientele which has been created by the alleged success of the Australian government policies in one region. If you close off routes of egress for people facing persecution, but do nothing to deal with the underlying situation of persecution, all you do is channel people into other routes of egress, which may be even more dangerous than those that they may have confronted in coming to one's own part of the world. Uh, and that's very much what we've been witnessing in, in recent times. Uh, now, where I tend to be nauseated by the hypocrisy of politicians is when we hear talk uh, about saving lives at sea as an overarching moral good which somehow overwhelms all the other horrors of Australian policy. Now, I want to make two comments about that. Um, The first comment I would make is that there is a subliminally racist element in this line of reasoning that has been too little noticed, and it comes in the following form. Implicitly what the politicians developing this argument are saying is that the kind of people who get on boats, these funny little brown people, are incapable of making decisions of an informed kind of their own. And therefore they need white bureaucrats and politicians in a country like Australia to think for them. That's the implication of what's being put forward. Now, 
The white politicians and bureaucrats, by the way, are people who typically have never experienced the kind of circumstances of repression in country of origin or vulnerability in country of transit, which the vast bulk of the time accounts for why people find themselves in the hands of people smuggled. I've spoken to a lot of people down through the years who have found themselves in, in this situation, and typically it's because they know that there's enormous risk of perishing at sea. Um, although 96% of people who got on boats to Australia got through safely. Uh, but nonetheless, the option seems better than being caught in a, a meaningless limbo forever. That's one element of the situation I want to highlight. But the deeper hypocrisy comes if you find out what it is that politicians are saying behind the scenes. And there we owe a debt to WikiLeaks. Because amongst the materials that WikiLeaks produced, um, um, was a very interesting cable from the US Embassy in Canberra to the State Department in Washington in November 2009 um, uh, about refugee policy. Uh, this was at the time of the Rudd government being in power. And the title of this section of the cable was Opposition Smells Blood. And it was specifically stated in the cable from the ambassador that a key Liberal Party strategist had said to the US Embassy that the issue of unauthorised boat arrival in Australia was fantastic and, quote, the more boats that come, the better. The more boats that come, the better. That is why when I hear politicians now clutching their hearts and saying that they're not driven by a desire to appease the far-right listeners of Alan Jones. How could anyone think that? They're trying to save lives at sea. At that point, I want to throw up on the carpet. Because this is, it's nauseating in general, but it's particularly nauseating when it is being used as a pretext for uh, cruelty towards people who have already suffered enormously. Uh, and 40 years ago, <laughs> years ago Professor Judith Schla from Harvard University wrote a very powerful book called Ordinary Vices. And the ordinary vice which she put at the top of her list was cruelty. Uh, and she elaborated in great detail why it was that cruelty was worse than any of the other uh, possible um, vices that you could identify. And ultimately it was in part because it corrodes the practitioner as well. And I think that's something worth bearing in mind when we look at, at deterrence as practiced by the Australian government. Just listening today to immigration department witnesses before Senate committees talking about their dispatch of a rape victim back to Nauru. One listens to that kind of thing and thinks that the capacity for moral reflection has been drained out of these people entirely. They, uh, they, the, the, the lemon has been squeezed until all the juice is gone and the pips are squeaking. And that's a terrible thing to happen to anybody. And uh, I think uh, it's perhaps not surprising that a lot of people from the Immigration Department have become refugees to other part of the Canberra bureaucracy in recent times because the point has been reached that uh, they can stomach no more. Now, having said that, I think Australian policies will prove very difficult to ex uh, extend to Europe. Firstly, the Europe, uh, Australia, in a, in a sense, is girt by sea, and that means that the numbers that at any time are likely to approach Australia would be very small, as historically we've seen. And you can be courageous with your navy uh, and set up a wall of steel around your country if you're not talking about large numbers. But when you are talking about what are in absolute terms substantial numbers, even if not in relative terms compared to population, then it's much harder to control a border. Um, I think the Australian policies have also shown that the rule of law tends to be a casualty fairly quickly uh, if one seeks to give effect to them. But in Europe, uh, the European uh, Court of Human Rights and a whole range of other institutions exist uh, rather robustly to protect against predations by the executive. And I suspect that there would be lots of cases going there which would uh, challenge any attempt to give effect to Australian policy in Europe. Uh, and I think also, uh, for all the Conservative parties may want to walk away with the clothes worn by the far right, uh, it can be harder to do this given the kind of electoral systems that exist in European polities, proportional representation or first past the post, than it is in a country like Australia where uh, compulsory voting um, and, uh, and preferential voting meant that harvesting 
the preferences of a party like uh, Pauline Hanson's One Nation was exactly what the Tampa affair was about in 2001, for example. Um, and finally, I think it's going to be difficult to find a Manus or a Nauru uh, to perform, perform the, the equivalent position for Europe. When we're talking about the numbers that have come into Europe, one would have to go act back actually to Hitler's idea of sending the Jews to Madagascar in order to come up with anything that would be remotely uh, uh, comparable. And perhaps fortunately, we're not looking at a situation in which a final solution to the refugee problem was going to be contemplated by uh, European governments. Although when one thinks about the treatment of the Jews in the 1930s, it's worth bearing in mind Australia's contribution at the Evian Conference in 1938, uh, called by President Roosevelt to look at the problems of Jews driven out of Germany in particular at that time. And, and T.W. White, the Australian delegate, the Minister for Trade and Customs, stood up in front of all the other delegates and said, uh, as we do not have a race problem, delegates will understand we are not in uh, any anxious position to acquire one. Uh, and I don't think we've moved on all that far from, uh, from, from that position uh, to the times in which we're living now. Let me conclude with one other reflection. 75 years ago, uh, in, at the end of May 1940, the British Expeditionary Force found itself captured in a pocket near Calais uh, in um, northern France uh, and, and Belgium after the collapse of the will of the French uh, army at the time. And no one seriously believed that it would be possible to rescue more than a tiny fraction of the, uh, uh, the British Expeditionary Force. In fact, little boats were mobilised from all over England to sail across the Channel to Dunkirk. Uh, and one of, the, one of the people who actually took his skip across to, to Dunkirk was the, uh, uh, the officer who had been the number two on the Titanic in 1912 when it went down. All sorts of people swung into action. And the bulk of the British Expeditionary Force was rescued, which allowed Britain to continue in the war. Over 100,000 French soldiers were also rescued from the beaches at Dunkirk and taken to Britain. And as far as I know, not one of them was asked to produce a visa when he arrived. <laughs> uh, there are circumstances in which, to put it bluntly, there are more important human considerations than pandering to the bureaucratic preoccupations of people in home offices or immigration departments. I think Australia has witnessed that in recent years. <laughs> and we haven't performed very well. I think there is an opportunity for Europe now to show what can be done in a humane and compassionate fashion and if it succeeds in doing so, it will throw the ball right back into the lap of the Australian government. Thank you very much. <laughs>